Thank you. Um, right, so, um, I, I, how do you describe myself? I, like I say, I've been doing kind of games for, a, I think, about 17 years, not quite two decades. Uh, back in the day where we were doing dial-up modem. Anyone remember dial-up modems? There's got to be some people who remember dial-up modems. I, I kind of uh, like to think of myself as uh, important because I, I saved Counter-Strike. Okay, it's a bit of a lie. It's not quite a lie. They ran out of money and we got them some new computers, so I think I deserve all the credit. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, okay. My biggest claim to fame, in some ways, is uh, Mike Bithell introducing me to someone as the free-to-play guy who's not a dick. That was quite a nice moment. Um, I work in Unity, um, and I'm an evangelist. I'm supposed to talk about uh, ads and um, social experiences, like every play where we record gameplay. Uh, in fact, that's why I'm on the on the podium talking about um, uh, how the guys at Hipster World made money. Um, so, but I thought. I'm kind of a bit intimidated. I'm in the lion's den. Here am I, the, the business guy. Not really. Um, I kind of am, but not really. Um, and I'm talking to the guys doing games as art as much as the guys trying to make money. So how about we do this? Let you decide what talk I'm going to give. Yesterday I gave a talk on making the good game what on earth a good game is, we'll get into if we go down that line. Uh, it's about asking questions about ethics, in particular, free to play, kind of inspired by the South Park episode many of you will probably have seen um, about free to play. So we could talk about that, we could talk about ethics, or we could do my original talk, which, although it sounds about ads, it's actually about design. It's about us as designers taking back the levers of monetization and making games that people don't hate because the ads get in the fucking way. So you have a choice. Which one do you prefer? So if you think we should be talking about ethics and game design, please put your hand up now. Hands up. OK, OK, that's pretty good. And if you think we should be talking about how we can make some money without being dicks, hand up. Oh, that is absolutely shocking me. I never expected that. We want to make money. Um, <laughs> Uh, see, now I'm, now I'm facing a Mac, and I don't use Macs. I'm a PC gamer. I'm a purist. Um, thank you. Yes. Macs are for hipsters. I'm not a hipster. Um, it's the make money one. Um, another one. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. See, I need, I need an assistant. Um, obviously, I've got a beautiful assistant, Lorenzo, here. Um, now, this is uh, a talk I did as a webinar, so if we rush through it, don't worry. Go look at the Unity blog. There's a whole bunch of practical advice. It's intended to be useful. It's intended to basically ask sort of, you know, serious, sensible questions like, uh, you know, um, should we be making money out of all the hundreds of people who play our games? Well, probably, but we don't have to be dicks about it. Uh, I'm going to swear a lot because I think it's interesting to try and sort of break down the barriers. So, anyone like banner ads? Banner ads, anyone? We like banner ads? No? No hands? Banners are great except for the 40% of which actually, which are either fraudulent or accidental. Um, so banners are a bit, basically a bit, a bit shit. Um, and um, they don't pay very well. Uh, and this is a, a really old image. Uh, I just think it's the best illustration. Uh, this is what happens when you follow someone's eyes when they're looking at a page that's got banners on. And the same thing exactly applies to games. I just couldn't find a good example. Um, anyone work out where the ads are? Oh, hang on a minute. Those green boxes were added later, by the way. Um, ooh. Oh, we had the fun and games of this presentation, not display. Yay, done it. OK, so um, obviously no one looks at ads. And there's a reason for that is as human beings, we're, we're animals. We're used to kind of protecting ourselves. And uh, we notice danger. We notice things that are outside the corner of our eyes. Uh, we want to think, keep attracting to the interesting stuff, not the stuff that's sat there we already know we don't want to deal with. So we automatically ignore banner ads. Um, interstitials, anyone like interstitials? Things that get in the way of your playing, anyone? Really? I mean, they're not terrible. I mean, you can make money out of them, don't get me wrong. But have, have you had that experience where you've plowed up a game and you start playing it and immediately it shows you an ad and then you've forgotten you're in a game? You think you're in a different game that you haven't done? Like, what? I, I, I find that a bit problematic. I mean, there's some better ways to do it. So, for example, if you have an interstitial over the top of your game, that kind of work. But is that satisfying? Are you delighted to be presented with an ad like this? Come on, someone's got to love this stuff. Any accountants in? 
Okay, so I, I think this stuff sucks. Um, native ads. Anyone like native ads? So this is the in-game stuff. I mean, it's actually not new. It's um, I, I, 10, maybe 12 years, maybe longer than that. A company called Massive was trying to do this in games like Splinter Cell. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this. There were like soda, um, soda machines that were labeled by a particular game company, or sorry, a particular soft drink brand like Tango or um, Coke or whatever. And they were actual ads that changed. You, so you can have a Coke soda machine or a Tango. I mean, do you care? I mean, really, would you go up to a soda machine in a game and click on it to get, I don't know, five pence off your next can of Coke? You just wouldn't, would you? There's, it's lots of friction, it's annoying, it gets in the way. I mean, it does, it does don't get me wrong, it does add context. It, it, you know, it's really nice when you're playing a racing game and you have actual ads that are appropriate because it feels like you're in an immersive world, it feels like the real thing. I get that. I just don't think it's a great way to make money. Anyone like offer walls? Come on, they give you these great things. Like, oh, there's, hey, I've got some hands up for offer walls. Yay! Woo! Um, Okay, there, there are some offers that maybe you want to get, you know, three months free access to Netflix or whatever, but you have to go through a huge process. I've got to go through that process and fill in all the forms, and I'm, I've, what was the game I was playing again? I've kind of forgotten. I've forgotten the game I was playing. And, oh, that's right, I have to go back. I don't think that's a good experience. Um, I mean, again, it can be really effective, and people do make lots of money on these things. Uh, when you're trying to use it to attract new users to your game, it can be quite interesting from the point of view of getting large volumes of people, but you don't tend to get a huge quality of players that way. Um, so it's difficult. I'm not trying to piss on other people's bonfires, by the way. I'm just talking as a guy who loves games and uh, happens to have an eye on business. What do these things do? How do they make me feel? How do they make me engage with an experience? Um, and this is what we do. Um, uh, I, anyone like Crossy Road here? Anyone think Crossy Road is a good game? I think it's a freaking awesome game. Um, I, I mean, not just because I kind of am paid to say that, but um, you know, these are great guys. These are truly independent developers who are, who've got lots of experience, who produce a game. I mean, how can you not love a game that turns the old school Frogger game into something new? It genuinely feels like Frogger. In fact, no, I'll tell a lie. It feels how I think Frogger felt when I first played it. It was never that when I first played it, but I imagined it was. It, it was so exciting to be able to play a game like Frogger. Like Frogger, I mean, anyone as old as me? Probably not. Um, who played it first time around, Frogger? For, hey, we've got, I've got some brothers and sisters out there who, who appreciate my pain that these retro games, are, we, we, we've seen it the first time around, the second time around, and I think this is the third time around. But these, this is what I love about these guys, is they, they didn't just sort of sit there and just copy something that was there. They added a different dimension to it, a different feel, a great art style. Emo Goose. Anyone got the Emo Goose? Oh, just brilliant. Well, you get the Emo Goose character and everything turns miserable and rainy. I love that. I genuinely love that. And I'm not, try I'm not here to talk up the game particularly, although I do. Um, I want to share with you why I love this stuff. So I love that character. I genuinely love that character. Anyone seen the Frankenstein? Frankenstein, anyone? Yeah, Frankenstein's great, isn't it? Everything is black and white, lightning bolts. I mean, just... None of it affects the gameplay. I mean, that's weird, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not against affecting gameplay, by the way. We'll probably get into that later. But there's something about being authentic in design and combining authenticity, authenticity in design with the way that we make money from our game. I think that's a good thing. Success can... We don't have to be squeezing players for every cent, every second of the day. In fact, if we do so, what we do is we kill off their long-term engagement. And when they spend money, it's they spend money because they're engaged over a longer period of time. The longer we keep them, the more likely we are to have a profitable game. Anyway, um, this is one of the core things for me. And it's something I know is very true to the hearts of the guys at Hipster Whale. Uh, and not just those guys. I mean, there's a whole bunch of guys at Rovio and so on and so forth. Okay, you may not believe me, but there are a whole bunch of guys at Rovio and Supercell who absolutely believe in respecting players. They absolutely do. And it's an incredibly important thing that you have to build a relationship with your audience 
And you, when you do that, when you engage with their audience, they're, they're willing to share their time and their, and their money. Not everyone's going to be handing over cash. This is the whole nature of the freemium model, is that we now can make our games available to a mass market audience. I think that's amazing. That people who never used to play games can now play our games. We can have these amazing arcs and stories and concepts, and we can make them accessible to people and still find a way to pay to be able to make the next game. We don't have to set our sights on making the billion dollar game, but we can still make healthy revenues. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Um, let's try and sort of explore that a bit further. Um, so when we choose to place ads, and it, it, this still applies if you're doing banners or if you're doing interstitials, but you know, one of the key things is understanding the frequency of play. And the really interesting experience I got, I, I'm, I started this presentation based on a, a conversation I had with uh, Matt from Hipsterwell in Casual Connect Amsterdam. And we were just talking about this on stage about how we can use design. And one of the things that came up for him is uh, they were talking about the idea of how to make people want to see ads regularly and not feel like it was exploitative. And he loved Disco Zoo. Anyone play Disco Zoo? It's a, it's a nice game, isn't it? It's very simple, but you don't object to getting an ad, do you? And there's lots of reasons to see lots of ads. And one of the things in their head is that if I can have a situation where people choose to see an ad regularly, then I can make a sustainable game without having to piss anyone off. That's a nice thing to do. So choosing your frequency, choosing the moments in which it's appropriate for show, show something or not, to make it so that you can look forward to the next opportunity to get an ad. Not showing it every time. Choosing the moment, the mode of experience and engagement. That's, I think that's a design choice. I think that's something that the money guys aren't any good at. I think it's only us designers who give a shit about the player experience and making sure it's engaging. It's only us who understand the flow and the ebb and the passion and the engagement. That means it's up to us to make it so that we can make our game commercially successful as well as artistically successful. And if we don't do that, I suspect we're being lazy. And that's a bit controversial, but why, why abnegate our responsibility to the commercial success of our game just because we want to have our kind of clean slate of how purest we are. We want this pure game. But actually, if you make monetization a design thing, then you're able to play with the, uh, the real world impact of an experience. And I think that's much more interesting as a game design challenge, where we can build in all of the emotional and gameplay levers and incorporate that into the way we make money. So if you're gonna have this idea of an opt-in ad, so like I say, Unity Ads is a, a system where you kind of, you show someone an offer, I'm gonna get 100 coins, say, to play this game. Uh, sorry, to watch this video. I watch a 15, 20 second video ad, and I move on. I don't have to do it, there's no point where I need to do it. So if I have that kind of system, why would they do it? Why would you choose to get a um, sit there through 15, 20 seconds of video of someone else's game when you're currently playing this game. Why would that be a good or a bad thing? That means we have to think about the psychology of the player. We have to think about the engagement of the player. We have to make them want to watch the ads. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, so let's do some examples. Let's see if this works. Uh -huh. Oops. Help. See, Max, you see. Max a horrible operating system. I hate it. I know lots of people love it. Can I have some help, please? I normally have my lovely Slate Pro, but this uh, connector's playing up if it's not flat. So, um. Aha. Do, do, do. Here we go. Can someone, how do I click that video? There we go. That should work. No, doesn't work. See, I've... Oh. <laughs> I hate this stuff. This is why I don't have a Mac, because I freaking hate him. Uh, here we go, right. Is this going to work? Work! 
play video. Yes, we got some video. So Sonic Dash, uh, nice little game. You're running away. Uh, you're trying to actually. Whoever did the recording of this video is really rubbish. Um, you play the thing. You get this opportunity to have a revive. You can either spend a coin you've earned in the game, or you can watch a video. So I'm getting a life. I got to watch this video. Um, I'm not a big fan of this this particular ad. Um, not exactly sure it's um, particularly targeted to a balanced audience, shall we say. But anyway, uh, so I've got my reward, I've come back in, and now I'm back into the game. Fantastic. Um, why is that interesting? Well, it's, it means that I've shown you something you want. I'm playing this game, I can complete this level. You want to complete this level, I've got the opportunity to do that. I can either do it through things I've earned in the game, or spend money, or watch an ad. I'm contributing to the, the revenue of the game. I know that consciously. I'm also able to just get on and play. And I can complete that level because I've watched that video. I feel good about that experience. I don't feel bad. Now, interestingly, if I do that, if I offer you the video ad every time, you stop valuing it. If you have the sort of opportunity for that to happen sometimes and not others, you actually value it more. Is that manipulation? Ooh, I, see, I, you should have come to my talk yesterday in Quo Valis. I'd have dealt with that. I'm not gonna, I haven't got time to deal with that now. We'll talk about the um, ethics another time over beer or whatever else. Um, I'm going to switch on to this one. So here's another example. So another way that we can look at the uh, kinds of rewards that we could look at giving players. He says, trying to not screw up the screen again. Oh, I did it. I did it, I'm learning. Maybe I'll convert to Mac, never. Um, so this is uh, Angry Birds Transformers, anyone seen that, play that? It's not a bad game, it's not the most exciting game for me, but I, I do actually quite enjoy it. Um, so we've got to the end, we've got our score, we've got our, our kind of gold coins, and then we get the option to double our rewards by watching a video. Nice and simple, straightforward. We watch the video, we go through that experience, I've got something, again, tangible. Rather than it being the uh, kind of extra life or the kind of energy point, I've now got some better score, but it's double. It's like any coin doubler. I feel good. I feel I can show off to other people how well I'm doing, but I've got benefit from watching a video. Let's have another example. Oh, um, I will cover this quickly just because I find it funny. Anyone think there's such a thing as pay to win? Hands up if you think pay to win is a thing. Hands up, anyone? You're all wrong. There's no such thing as pay to win. It's called a broken game. So, you know, let's stop arguing about pay to win or not. If you are stupid enough to have a mechanic that is only win or fail, and you try to put virtual goods in, and you have problems because you're basically unbalancing the game, that's because you haven't designed the game properly. So deal with that. Um, anyway, sorry, that's my... Tangent, so anyway. Um, I thought I heard a ripple there. I thought somebody agreeing with me, never. Um, so let's have another example. Now, I'm not a fan of interstitials. However, this is quite well done um, in, in interstitial terms. This is uh, from Dumb Ways to Die 2. Anyone seen Dumb Ways to Die? Great game, fantastic game. When you leave, you, know, you get to the end of the level, you're gonna die, uh, and then you choose to go back to the menu, and only when you choose to go back to the menu... <laughs> Shadow Kings, build a mighty city and rule your own kingdom. You have the power. Play Shadow Kings on your smartphone or tablet now. So when it's, when it's this kind of interstitial, one of the nice things about it is you can skip it. In, in fact, what's really interesting is people don't generally skip when you've opted for the video, but they do like the skip when you don't give them the choice. So if you think about the experience, think about the flow of the player through the game. Don't just assume that this is going to be kind of, you know, easy. Oh, I don't care what the player thinks. I'm just going to force them to watch 20 seconds. Well, guess what? You're going to piss some players off if you do that. You're not creating delight. You know, what are we doing if we're making games and we're not trying to make delight? I mean, seriously. Why are we bothering if we're not intending to make delight? And that's why I think this stuff is important. It's about the tick and the tock, the flow of the player, choosing the right moment, choosing the right experience. When, I mean, one of the things I, I think about with this is, I, I use a TikTok reference for thinking about the intensity of a, of a player in a game. 
So if you if you go, I'm playing, I'm getting intense, intense. As I as I go through the flow, I'm getting faster and faster, and more and more intense. And then as I start to tire, it starts to slow down, and I get to the end, I can't carry on anymore. And that's a perfect point to stop, and then give me a chance to relieve. Oh, relax. Oh, and so and then I start to get a bit twitchy fingers, and I want to stop playing it. So knowing this kind of flow, this twitch, this pendulum movement of player emotions in in your game is really important. Being sensitive to that in the way you monetize a game is also important. And I'm back to the fact that this is a design choice. Is your data analyst going to know about the emotional feel of the game? Is he? Is that his training? If you're a designer, your training is to deliver delight and experiences and to understand that pace and that flow. You're the guys who have to make the decision. And if you can do it well, you won't piss off the players. In fact, you might actually find they start looking forward to the next ad. Imagine that. Can you imagine looking forward to seeing an ad? I don't want to go too far, because that could be you know, misunderstood. I don't, I'm not trying to say this is, you know, I have occasionally used the phrase, ads players love. That's probably a little bit over the top. But having something where you're actually anticipating the ad. So here's an example where, uh, anyone seen the retry game from Robbio? Yeah. Good game, anyone? Yeah? Good? I think it's good. Um, it's got, a, got that Flappy Birds thing, but it's got a kind of endless stream, and you want to have these save points so you don't have to retry the thing you just did. So here's, the, here's an example. Uh, so I'm actually anticipating the chance to use a video ad in order to get my save point. So again, trying to use the Mac interface. There you go. Uh, here we go. So I'm flying away, flying away, flying away, and I land. So I get the choice now to use a coin or to watch a video. Bing, I'm, a, I'm now watching my video. 15, 20 seconds later, and boom, boom, boom. We're back in to the game about now. So here we are, it's now unlocked that level, that, that part I can now carry on playing, having unlocked that save point. Fantastic. I've got, again, another benefit that's scalable to the game. So it's not overpowering the game, it's appropriate, I feel the value, all this kind of stuff. I think that's cool. Um, hmm. That's gone all pale, fair enough. Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm kind of getting my point across that we should be thinking about things like frustration and relief. We should be thinking about the flow of the game. We should be thinking about game design issues and delivering on them. And what's really interesting if you have a game that's got in-app purchase, video ads can actually help stimulate the interest as well. It's really tough to get decent data to prove that, by the way, uh, because every game is different in the way it designs um, various in-app purchases. But there's some really interesting kind of analysis going on. There was a Wall Street, uh, I think it was a Wall Street Journal article that talked about how it, it's influenced. Anyone wants to know about that, I'll happily give them the link later. Um, this is an example I don't think is very good. Uh, well. It serves a purpose, but it's sometimes we can get a bit shy about asking for money. I mean, I shy is too wrong a word, but let, let's, let's, let's show, show this and see what you think. Um, here we go. So this is the hill, um, hill Climb Racer. Great game. Uh, when you want to get... <laughs> So what it did is I went to look at coins as all sorts of price points. I hate that mechanism, by the way, just, just so you know. Uh, but then it gave you the option to get some free stuff as well, and in that free stuff, which is buried away, buried away right down deep in the list, uh, you could then get these 15,000 coins or whatever it was, and then it would give you those coins. Is that a good way to work? I'm not so sure. Do you get passionate about buying coins? I don't get passionate about buying coins. The funny thing is, it seems to work if you do all this data analysis uh, that a lot of these, uh, these companies do. It's also easier to manage on the App Store. So I kind of get it, but I personally felt that I'm left a bit sort of dissatisfied about that idea. So I, I, I don't know what the answer is to that. I think it's interesting. It does work to an extent, but I'm not sure that's a good design approach. So anyway, that's, that's me talking about that. Um, I won't, well, I'll give you this. So one interesting thing we've learned, uh, if you do choose to go down this route, 
is that um, you have to be a bit careful with any economy. Whenever there's goods, whenever there's assets, uh, you've got to be a bit careful about how much you can get through paying versus uh, watching ads versus playing the game. Um, what we found is something like half a cent to two cents per view value seems to avoid those problems for most games. Just so you know, that's an interesting kind of way of thinking about it. Uh, and I mean, this is to me the sort of almost the perfect example. Um, you know, it, it's a game I love, as you already heard me say. So let's just see that. I thought it had sound, but clearly not. So we're running away across the road, and then it's that. And I get the choice. Not always, but I get the choice to watch the thing. Watch the, uh, the ad. That's going to give me 20 coins. I use those 20 coins to uh, get a random uh, draw on one of the characters. So I get access to more characters than I would have done otherwise. And as we said earlier, the characters don't change the gameplay. They just make the experience more joyful because they're adding this variety. Um, bingo, got my coins. Thank you very much. Everything feels good. I feel happy. I don't feel like I've been exploited. Especially when you start getting these characters that are, like I say, the emu goose and the um, so emo. I said the emu goose. That's really odd. Emo goose. And um, it's, not, it's my native language, and I still can't speak it. Um, but uh, yeah, all these kind of characters really add to the sort of spirit of the gameplay. But what's critical to all this is something which maybe, as designers, we're not taught enough about. I happen to be a trained marketeer. I happen to have spent a lot of time looking at economics and psychology of purchase and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, as well as being a fanatical game player and designer, um, I, I love this stuff so much. But I also like the science of it. I love the analysis of how people play. There is a paper by uh, Bo uh, Park and Lee, South Korea. Again, I'll give you the details of that offline if you're interested. Um, that talks about why we spend money in, in games. So how, hands up if you think you spend money in games because you're happy. Anyone? You're happy because so you spend money, yeah? No. Nope. Uh, how much, uh, uh, the, well, uh, there are lots of different examples, but I'm just going to go straight for it. The reason why people spend money from the, the, from the data is purely because they expect future value. So there's a comment, I think, for the previous speaker about why not give the game away free more. Uh, and I'm not sure I heard the question properly, so I'm not going to kind of point that out. But there's a lot of designers out there who want to give their games away for free. Hands up if you want to give your game away for free. OK, it's for you. And I respect that. And I think that's an important part of, of game design because you can take risks. You don't have to sort of worry about whether you're going to get income or not because you're not going to get any income. And that's about producing art. But if you want to be able to make your next game, I think making money is an actually important commercial imperative, and it forces us to make decisions. It makes decisions that are supposed to be appropriate for a player. If we're going to do that, we have to know what they expect. We have to understand how we can offer them value that they desire. That's the important thing I think is missing from a lot of the free-to-play games that we see people complaining about. The idea that we can be passionate about the things that we buy, that we can desire them, that we even understand what they mean, is often missed. We have to make sure players already understand what they're getting. And if you're going to use ads in this opt-in way, it's just as important as if you're selling in app purchases. Why do people want to watch the ad? What's in it for them? What do they get out of it? What's the future value? And like I say, that's not me making that up. That's something that applies to every industry. I was marketing 101. In fact, the phrase, I, my first day I did training in marketing, I was told this phrase, identify and satisfy consumer needs. It's not about exploiting people. It's not about taking money out of their wallet. It's not about uh, damaging an experience. It's not about making something that's not too problematic. It's identifying and satisfying players. And if we don't have that mission as designers, I don't think we're making the best games we could. Yes, we might be making great art. If it's a vision that you want to share, sure. But if you want a commercial game and you ignore the audience, I think you're missing out. I think you're actually missing out on an opportunity to make more interesting, more challenging commercial choices. 
I think that's an interesting aspect. And if you do it, guess what? It can pay off. I mean, the, you know, the, the Crossy Roads example, obviously, is, is a fantastic one, and it's, it's an outlier. I'm not going to suggest that everyone's going to do that. You know, you're not all going to leave this room and suddenly make a three million out of, uh, you know, in 100 days on your, on your ads. But know what your success looks like. Know what's in it for the player. Understand why they appreciate what you're offering them and make it worthwhile. Make it valuable, and then you might have some success. I hope that wasn't too dickish. I hope that was interesting enough. Some of you are still here, so, well, most of you are still here, so not too many people walked out. I'm more than happy to ask questions on anything. It doesn't have to be about this. I'm notably uh, without um, um, any, well, there's no subject I don't have an opinion on, so uh, feel free to ask any questions. Am I getting ad revenue? No, sadly. That would have been smart. Yeah, I just, uh, so the question was, am I getting ad revenue from showing you ads? Unfortunately not, because I wasn't smart enough to do it on an iPad with live games. That would, next time, that's brilliant. I'm going to steal that. That's a brilliant idea. So I just, I just had my, my ass handed to me and taught a lesson. So yeah, cool. Uh, the, there's a question still. Uh, well, so, uh, you had your hand up first, though. Yeah. It's a really fascinating topic, and I've had this conversation with a friend of mine who was trying to make a kind of evil, uh, evil game, uh, deliberately evil game, and so it would be full of ads that would be po positioned as if they were like vile and horrible. And for some reason, he couldn't get ad providers to to go with it. Um, however, it's all about positioning, isn't it? You know, if you think about it, if we, are you? If you suck at the game, do you have to tell the player that they suck at the game all the time? Um, I think there are some games where that's great. So, I mean, my, one of my, my favorite examples of kind of difference of approaches is when you look at threes versus 2048. How many people are fans of 20, uh, how many, sorry, how many fa people here are fans of threes? Great, how many people are fans of 2048? So I'm a 2048 fan because it makes me feel good. Threes makes me feel like I'm shit. Because I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough as a player to play threes, and it punishes me. Same with the Flappy Birds and all that kind of stuff. And I like things like Dark Souls, don't get me wrong, but they make me feel rubbish. But that's the design. And that's kind of where I think I'm, uh, uh, hopefully I'm answering the question, which is, it's about the design decisions you make. And if you provide the right context that you're kind of hiding it from the advertiser. Most people won't be too worried about it, I suspect. But it's gonna come through in your CPA. You know, so if players look at a video and they think they're being punished looking at it, do you think they're more likely to think favorably about that video? And if you don't feel favorably about the video, are you likely to go download it? And I'm, I'm actually feeling right now that I'm spending more time looking at video ads to find games because I can at least see what the game does without having to plow through the huge amount of dross that's on app stores. So, I mean, that's it's me. But you know, I like watching a video of a, of a game, particularly when I discover something I've not seen before, and I look at the gameplay and go, that's brilliant, I want to play that. So I don't know if I answered the question, but hopefully it was useful. I'm getting, um, it, a couple more, okay, good, good, good. Um, this lady here was, I think was the other person who was, So, I mean, this is actually a really important point. So the question was basically about uh, who's making any money. Given that we've got a free game that's being um, advertising other free games, who's actually making the money? Well, the, the thing is that the, the reality of these kind of games is that we're, we're democratizing the accessibility to a game, which is a good thing. Within that democratizing, 
we have a whole bunch of people who will drop out, who, who will never get past day one. So somewhere between 40 and 60 people will drop out from day one um, in, in a game. Because let's not confuse a free-to-play game with a paid game. A customer of a paid game buys it in the store. A customer for a, uh, a, a free-to-play game doesn't make that decision until they've been playing. And are you a customer if you're a repeat player, or are you only a customer if you're a repeat payer? And I think that we, we try and mix these two up without really thinking about what we're saying. So, to, but to your very, very important point, if we're only showing game ads, what happens? Where's the money coming from? Well, the reality is that what these kind of ads in particular, but ge ads in general, are allowing us to access that audience that isn't inclined to pay. Yes. But there is, in well-designed games, there is an audience that is willing to pay, that sees the value in the assets and the, and the opportunities in the in-app purchase. For example, what if it adds a new level of strategy or, or some other flavor or allows me to show off? All these things are really powerful things that people love doing. So I would expect, and again, it's old data, but I'd expect something like 24 to 30% of the revenue to come from ads and the rest to come from in-app purchase in a reasonably well-designed game. So whilst you're absolutely right, where's that money coming from? If I'm right, and it's still the case that something like 25 to 35 percent, sorry, 25 to 30 percent of the revenue is coming from ads, and the rest is coming from in-app purchase, then there's plenty of space for that to be a sensible business. But it is a question that keeps coming up because there's a there's a feeling a lot of people have that this is a bubble. Uh, I'm not convinced it's a bubble for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary one is um, it's basically an economics principle. We have an infinite supply of games right now. 362 games a day, every day in February. Think about that. And you guys are making games, and you're going up against 362 games just on the iOS app store every freaking day. How the hell are you going to get found if we're not using things like ads? How the hell are you going to get revenue if you're not being featured by Apple? Are they going to feature 362 games every day? I don't think so. So you've got to be extraordinary. You've got to be distinctive. And you've got to think about every pixel and its impact on the user flow at every life stage. And sometimes you'll find players who will come in and go. Sometimes you'll find players who will come in and continue playing. And what they do is they create the context, the reason why people who are willing to spend money stay playing your game. I mean, I, I used to work on PlayStation Home, so I'm currently in mourning because they shut the PlayStation Home down on the 1st of April. Uh, I'm, I'm very sad, it was my baby for a while. Um, there was a fantastic thing uh, we saw when people were able to get things like a, a gold suit that had money coming out the pockets. It was like the most expensive thing we had. I think, I can't remember if it was like $15, maybe $100, I, I can't remember how much it was. It's completely pointless. But you look rich, hey, got money coming out of my pockets. Aren't I awesome? And people would actually deliberately buy it so they could all turn up at the right time in the right space so you have a room f full of 60 people dressed up like asses in gold suits. That's the fun of PlayStation Home. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, I've got I to gotta, I gotta close it down. But I mean, I don't know if I answered the question. Hopefully I did. The point is that we, we think about these things as moments in time. Games are not moments in time. Games are journeys. We should be engaging players over their life cycle. And to do that, we have to be designers, not money guys. I hope you do more of that. Thank you very much.